It's often not the destination which matters most, but what we discover of God and of ourselves on the journey. That's what stays with us and shapes us into fuller people. Ordinary time. Ordinary, yes, but perhaps not quite so ordinary as we softly tread in the footsteps of Jesus. And in the unexpected twists of a well-spun parable and the turns of lives redirected anew towards God, we embrace the adventure, growing taller yet. Hello and welcome to Windows on Worship. My name's Carl and it's wonderful to have you with us, especially if you're a first time viewer for Windows on Worship, you're really welcome. This week we're thinking about Jesus dealing with a nasty trick question that was designed to catch him out and to make him look bad either to the crowds that were listening to him teach or the Roman authorities. And we'll think about what his rather enigmatic answer to that question might mean for us today. Before we get started on our act of worship, however, if you've not done so already, you might like to download the worship sheet for today. You don't need to, but you may find it useful as we work our way through our act of worship. The link's just below the video in YouTube, but you might need to click on show more to reveal it. The front side of the worship sheet has some space for you to make your own notes as we go along, some questions for you to ponder along the way, and various places where you're invited to share your thoughts and prayers with others in the comments section, particularly if you're watching the premiere and can use the live chat function in YouTube. The reverse side of the worship sheet contains the jukebox playlist, a set of YouTube videos chosen especially to help you go further in your praying and pondering through the week. So we come to our opening prayer that gathers us together before God and with one another. The words for this are on the worship sheet, but as we move through the act of worship, what you'll need will be on the screen. And if you'd like to, please join in with the words that are in bold and yellow type, either in your head or out loud as you're most comfortable. So let us pray. God of adventure and growth, open our hearts, ready our minds and fire our imaginations so that as we gather together before you, use technology to connect with each other and ponder the life-giving stories of Jesus, we might discover more of your goodness and be swept up by the Holy Spirit as she nurtures, disturbs and inspires us on our journey into fullness of life. Amen. To get you thinking about this week's theme and the sorts of things we're exploring, here is a starter for 10. You're invited to have a think about this and if you're watching the live version in particular, you might wish to share your answer to this question in the live chat. So, do you belong to any groups or organisations which are particularly important to you? And how do these things shape your priorities in life? So we come now to our prayers of thanks and praise. 
And this week, to aid us in our prayer, we're going to use Psalm 24, which is a wonderful psalm of praise. And I'm going to use the version in the Methodist hymn book, Singing the Faith. So if you have a copy of that, you may wish to turn to number 806, number 806, though the words will be on the screen. And during this time, if you'd like to share something that you're thankful for uh, from this past week with others, please do so in the live chat box. So let us pray. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. This week on Windows on Worship, we're once again privileged to be able to share in hearing about someone's story of how the lockdown has been for them, where they've found joys and challenges in the midst of that, and where they've encountered God in these past few months. So my name is Moira, and um, uh, I have three children, and I'm married. Uh, my husband lives in Amsterdam, and we live here. That's me. I'm a, I'm a Methodist. I'm a Christian. And I have been since birth. And so has my family. For all our generations, we've all been um, attached to the Methodist church. So how has the experience of lockdown been for you? Well, it's been a mixed experience. Um, it was quite disturbing at the beginning because when school shut down, Obviously, the children were at home. So having teenagers, twins, uh, that are 18 and a seven-year-old, wasn't easy at home. <laughs> and because I have a quite, quite a, a big family network, we kind of supported each other. But after a while, it started to get, oh my goodness, you know, what's going on? Is yeah. this the end? Are we staying indoors? Is, is this it? Is this our lives where we can just go to buy food and come back? Is this the end of the world, you know? Yeah. And it did make me start to think that what's happening? I'm, I'm happy for my faith that I am a strong believer and I believe that, you know, God was always looking down on us. He wouldn't just let anything happen to you like that. Um, and I, I just think that uh, my faith has helped me through the lockdown definitely yeah so is there anything in the midst of that that's inspired you what has inspired me is it's my belief my belief that um if you do believe and you do believe that there's a god above that is looking after all of us you will succeed in anything that you do mm. um and that's my inspiration that i i have a belief and I want to continue believing that. And I want my children to continue believing so that they can be strong people. So it's fundamentally about trust then, I guess. Yes. Mine is trust and believing. And have you, in the midst of this, learnt anything new or surprising about God? So he's always surprising. God is always surprising us in the sense that 
he's telling you that I am there. So have faith in me, look up to me. So your faith's definitely been the thing that's sustained and, and kept you going through. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't believe that, for example, people getting up every day and going to, for example, they go to church morning and evening every single week or every single day. That doesn't mean that you're a good Christian. I believe it's what you do and how you live your life. Um, what do you do for others? You know, how do you help others through this lockdown situation? Um, I just accept every day as it comes. So long as I have my health, my faith and my family are there. Um, that's the main thing for me. Yeah. How has it been in terms of you and your husband being in different countries? Has, has, has that been a... Uh, sure. It's, it's been a bit of a chore, um, but we speak three to four times. As soon as any time I have a moment, uh, I'll call to find out what's happening. And uh, he also has a network of friends and family with him. So I, I feel as if we're next door to each other, but we're not sitting in the same house. It has been challenging, but we got used to it. We've got used to it. But I cope. I'm quite tough. A bit of a tough cookie. <laughs> I don't doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tend to manage, can do everything. And during a lockdown, um, the work in the garden, because I have quite a big garden, and there was a lot of work. And that was one of the things that kept me sane, I think, was my garden. And uh, looking at my flowers starting to bloom, that made me happy. That would always put a smile on my face, and it still does, to think that I did that. Yes. I done that. Mm. I got an olive tree that I got that was quite, it was about seven inches tall, and I planted that, and it's starting to bloom. It's, you know, it's growing. Mm. And um, I feel, wow, I've been looking after this, and it's, it's surviving. It didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good feeling, that, isn't it, when you, you've made it's, it grow. It's, it's brilliant. So is there anything about how our society runs, the way the world works, that you'd like to see change in the light of what's happened in the last few months? Yes, I think this world, if we could all learn to be each other's keeper, it would have made the lockdown a lot easier. There's a lot of people out there that do want you to say, hi, how are you doing? Um, I'm just popping down to the shop. Would you like something? You know? Um, and I feel that if, if we were, if even, even if half of us were to be like that, we could help so many people. I try my best to live a good life, you know, to do the right thing. I try, I'm not the best. You know, nobody's perfect. I have my faults. Um, but I do try. I try. What is wrong? I try and uh, walk away from wrong and try my best to do good all the time. You know, although it's never enough, is it? It's never enough, but I try. Our reading comes today from Matthew's Gospel once again, chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. We're looking at the story of Jesus being asked a particularly nasty trick question while teaching in the temple courtyard. As we listen to this story, you may wish to make some notes uh, about those things that particularly jump out for you as you hear this reading on the worship sheet. Those things might just point to the things that God is wanting to say to you, especially today. So with the help of our cuddly friends, here is our gospel reading. The Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you don't regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor? or not. But Jesus, 
aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this? And whose title? They answered, The emperor's. And Jesus said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. I wonder, friends, if you've ever found yourself in a situation where someone asks you a question, and even if they didn't mean to do so, they put you in a really difficult position. You find yourself realising that if you answer yes to their question, you'll upset one group of people. But if you say no, you'll have another group of people being angry with you. And it feels like you're just in a no-win situation. One of the skills that journalists need when they interview politicians and other people in authority is the ability to ask questions that force the interviewee to take a stand on the issues that are in hand, even if it may feel like they're in a no-win situation and whatever they say is going to upset one constituency or another. Now, there's nothing wrong with that per se. After all, the role of journalists in that situation is as much as anything else to hold those in power accountable. However, if that's done simply to try and make the person who's being interviewed look bad or to trip them up for the sake of it, then I think it becomes something else. It oversteps the mark. There is a real difference between encouraging somebody to come off the fence and trying to entrap someone. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus encountered the latter scenario, having found himself facing what must have seemed like a no-win situation. People were deliberately trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. Now, as per last week's Windows on Worship, we're picking up the story of Jesus in the, two, the Temple Courtyard in Jerusalem following on from his triumphal entry into the city on Palm Sunday, which was laden with symbolism that any other Jew would have recognised. This was the Messiah, the Holy One of Israel, at last come to the Holy City. The chief priests and the elders, temple authorities in other words, had demanded to know by whose authority Jesus was doing these things. And in the last couple of weeks on Windows on Worship, we've examined two of the three parables that Jesus told in response to them. After this bit of storytelling, they backed off, but then other groups who also wanted to challenge Jesus stepped forward and took over. And this passage for today forms one of four confrontations that occurred between Jesus and these various groups, each of which had their own particular axes to grind. So in today's story, we have an unholy alliance that has been formed between, on the one hand, a group of Pharisees, who were one of the significant uh, religious groups within Judaism and very powerful and influential on the one hand, and the Herodians on the other. These were people who represented the puppet government whose strings were pulled by Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor. Now up to that point, the Pharisees had been, along with various others, looking for an opportunity to arrest Jesus, but had been unable to do so because the crowds viewed him as a prophet, and if they'd moved against him, that risked creating civil unrest, which is exactly what they wanted to avoid with Pilate being in town. But they figured that if they joined with the enemy, it offered them a chance to catch Jesus out forcing him either to put himself in the firing line of the Romans or risk the wrath of the crowds. So they sent one of their disciples along to try to flatter Jesus, to butter him up with nice words all about 
What a wonderful person of integrity Jesus was. And then they sprung their trap. And it really was a tricky question they asked Jesus. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the Roman emperor or not? It put Jesus in a no-win situation because on the one hand, if he said yes, then he'd be seen as yet another collaborator with Rome, a traitor and a sellout, and his popularity with the people would vanish instantaneously. But on the other hand, if he answered no, then he would be branded a radical and a revolutionary and a rebel. And that wasn't uh, a course of action one would necessarily wish to follow. Such people met sticky ends. Jesus may well have known about an event that happened um, when he was a young child in the year six. A guy called Judas of Galilee led a violent rebellion um, that was all about not wanting to pay these hated Roman taxes. Mass crucifixions followed that attempted uprising with crosses scattered throughout the countryside, making the point that the tribute payable by every man and woman and slave to the emperor was not optional. So in this tricky situation where Jesus risked on the one hand upsetting the crowds and on the other um, putting himself in the firing line of the Roman authorities, what did Jesus do? How did he respond to this nasty question? We're told that Jesus asked the Pharisees for a denarius, which was the Roman coin that was used to pay this tax, um, and it was equivalent to roughly a day's wages for a labourer. Now these Roman coins had the image of Caesar Augustus on them, and they made some pretty highfalutin claims in the inscriptions about who he was. They said he was the son of God and that he was the high priest. And these claims were offensive in the extreme for the Jewish people because they violated the commandments that had been given to Moses in Exodus chapter 20 about having no other gods but Yahweh and about not worshipping graven images. As a slight aside, I can't help but wonder how the crowds reacted to the Pharisees carrying these idolatrous coins around with them and in the temple of all places. Evidently, some of the Pharisee party might have found this difficult. We know that some of them were so opposed to paying these taxes because they violated the holiness laws against collaborating with foreign rulers that they were willing to join in yet another armed rebellion in the year 66, which we know didn't end well. Those uprisings eventually led to the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Returning to today's story, when the Pharisees had confirmed that it was indeed Caesar's image on the coin, Jesus told them to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. It was, Matthew tells us, a masterstroke, one which left his opponents amazed. But what was Jesus actually saying here? This is the issue, what to make of this verse, that lies at the heart of this passage. And trying to make sense of it takes us deep into highly contested and complex territory. Some have argued, based on texts like Leviticus chapter 25 verse 23 and the first verse of Psalm 24 that we used for our prayers and thanks and praise earlier, that Jesus very clearly advocated not paying the tax because everything belongs to God and nothing belongs to Caesar. So that's one way you could read this. Some scholars, however, have taken the exact opposite view to that. And they've argued, based on passages like the first few verses of Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 13, and Peter's words in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17, that, of course, Jesus would want the people to pay the tax because the Roman government was sanctioned by God, as are any other lawful orderly governments. Now, I'm not convinced by any of these readings that suggest that what Jesus was saying was very clearly yes or very clearly no. And that's primarily because I doubt if he'd done that, that both the Pharisees and the Herodians would have been satisfied with his answer. And we know that both groups went away with their tail between their legs. More promisingly, 
Barbara Reed and Janine Brown argue that Jesus sidesteps the trap was, that was laid for him while asserting very clearly that our primary loyalty must be to God. Moreover, and unlike Caesar, whatever the coins claimed, Christ is indeed Lord of all creation. And so other things may try to come along and lay claim to us, but our primary allegiance, our first allegiance, must be to Jesus and to the kingdom of God. Tom Wright makes a similar point in his commentary about this reading, suggesting that Jesus' answer to this question about taxes was simultaneously both and neither. He was treading a very careful middle way between violent rebels at one extreme and complete sellouts to Rome at the other. And it was about much more than trying to wriggle out of a tight spot. For Wright, the key here is that what's going to happen a few days later when Jesus is crucified and then rises again will defeat Rome and indeed all other oppressive powers, but not in the way that the religious zealots who wanted violence wanted or expected. Now I think there is a lot to be said for this kind of explanation that holds on to the enigmatic nature of Jesus' response. And I think it's also important to keep in mind, as Wright does, that this passage was never trying to be the last word about the relationship between Christianity and politics. We have to be so, so careful, I think, about placing more weight onto any one particular text in the Bible than it's able to bear. And for what it's worth, Readings of this text that suggest that Christianity and politics are mutually exclusive owe far more to Enlightenment dogma, I would argue, than to anything we actually find in the New Testament. Moreover, I suspect that those contending on the basis of this passage that God isn't interested in mundane things like how we use our money, or that governments must always be obeyed no matter what, I suspect these people are reading their own political bias into the text which is something that's quite easy to do. Jesus, after all, had an awful lot to say about simultaneously prioritising God and mammon. That's wealth and possessions. And when we do see in Isaiah 45, for example, God working through the authority of a ruler, in this case, Cyrus the Great of Persia, there are also plenty of biblical examples of God taking rulers to task, holding them to account. So I don't think it's as clear cut as all governments must always be obeyed. So we're left with the question, friends, of what do we take away from all of this? Well, in the spirit of what I've just said about not weighing um, a particular text down with too much stuff, I'm very reluctant to use this passage to try and build a kind of political theology, as I know some have done or even to weigh into debates about the boundaries of religious freedom in a secular state, particularly at a time when political polarisation is rife and the authority of God gets claimed for opposing views on a range of contentious issues. I think there is the risk when we look at this text and various others that I've mentioned throughout this um, exploration of projecting our own concerns onto the text and thus ultimately onto God as if we know what God's will is and God happens to agree with our particular views. Perhaps, as we deal with life in a messy world, where the paths of righteousness are not always actually clear to us, and we can feel we're in no-win situations, that the most we can sensibly do with this passage is, firstly, to keep in mind that Jesus is indeed Lord, and secondly, to remember that discernment is a practice that is best shared. So we keep in mind Jesus is Lord and remember that discernment is best done as a shared enterprise. I think the latter, this point about discernment, is particularly important because the fact is that very few of us are blessed with the kind of capacity for navigating really complex and difficult no-win situations that Jesus displayed. 
And the fact is, very often we need the help of others in navigating the challenges of being a disciple of Christ in the midst of everyday life, with all of its messiness and complications and grey areas. Before training to be a Methodist minister, I worked for a major high street bank. And I was once asked to do something that I felt was basically asking me to be dishonest. But I also knew that I was running um, a great deal of risk if I refused to do what I was being told. And what I found hardest about that situation was not so much the challenge to my integrity, actually as the complete either indifference or lacklustre response, one might say, of my fellow Christians when I shared my dilemma. It was as if my profession, being a banker, blinded them to my desire to try to figure out what the right thing to do was in that situation. Now, thankfully, my line manager supported me in this scenario, and so I didn't end up losing my job. But I've never forgotten the feeling that that, um, that experience left me with, that we need to be much more willing to help one another discern what a kingdom pathway looks like in testing situations. After all, very few of us will have the luxury of going through life and never finding ourselves in what feels like a no-win situation. So the bottom line here might be not some neat formula about the relationship between faith and politics, but more a, a call to make more time to engage with the messiness of a world where there are lots of conflicting priorities. And thus, a call, I suppose, to make time to help one another get through and to do so with love, care and wisdom. Amen. So we now come to our prayers of renewal that give us space to lay before God those things in our own lives that need God's renewal and refreshment, but also those things in the life of our world that don't reflect God's love as their top priority. So let us pray. God of costly and self-giving love, you call us to be people of integrity and justice, pointing to you in all of our words and actions. So we bring to you those things in need of renewal in our own lives and in the life of the world we share. We bring to you those things for which we are sorry. God of mercy, forgive us. We bring to you the burdens we carry and the sorrows we bear. God of love, comfort us. We bring to you the brokenness and oppression in our world. God of justice, disturb us. We bring to you the times that we've hidden from the risks of love. God of courage, fortify us. And we bring to you the failures of your church to stand for justice. God of liberation, convict us. God of costly and self-giving love, you call us to be people of integrity and justice. We point to you in our words and actions. Thank you that you set us free to follow you and to be ambassadors for your kingdom of love. Amen. Each week on Windows on Worship, we recommend a resource that you might find helpful if you want to go deeper and carry on thinking and pondering um, about those things that we've been looking at during this act of worship. This week I'm suggesting that you might want to check out the website of an organisation called Christians in Politics. 
Christians in politics try to encourage Christian people to get involved in public life. And their website contains some really helpful material around um, some of the issues that Christians might encounter getting involved in politics. And in particular, and thinking through some of the ways in which this text and others might influence our understanding of what that means. So that's the website of Christians in Politics. And you can find the link on the worship sheet. So we come to our prayers of intercession, our prayers for others. This week there will be some images on the screen from uh, things that have been in the news and other issues that you might like to pray about. Um, and there'll be some quiet music as we watch these images. During this time, if there's anything that you'd like the Windows on Worship team to pray for, please do share that in the comments section. So friends, let us pray. And so as our Saviour taught us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So thank you for tuning in to Windows on Worship today. I hope you found this act of worship helpful and engaging. If you'd like to be a subscriber to Windows on Worship and you aren't already, 
A subscribe button will pop up towards the end of this video, so do click on that. I hope you to keep in touch with us. As I said right at the start, there's a jukebox playlist of other videos to help you in your praying and pondering throughout the week. And a link to that will also pop up towards the end of this video. You can also find the list on the worship sheet. And finally, on the worship sheet, there are some Bible study questions for you to think about as we make our way through the week to help you again go deeper into this passage. But for now, as we go our separate ways, go about our week, a prayer of blessing. So let us pray. God of all our journeys, as we go forward into the rest of the week, may you be the light to our path and the breath that we breathe. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and all whom you love and pray for now and forevermore. Amen.